Hello, everybody. How's everyone tonight? No. Welcome back. Um, yeah. You may have been here many, many times. We have been here uh, quite a few times over the past, it seems like, five years or so. Maybe not that long. Um, but we're here to talk to you about uh, the work that the Bethel Royalty Merger Committee has been doing. Um, it's pretty exciting work. We're very, very kind of fired up uh, about this plan and, and hope that you will be too. Um, this version of the brief, you may have seen some of these, it's going to look very similar to you, but there's not a lot of the, um, the contextual stuff that you, saw, that you saw before. We tried to reduce that and really focus on the stuff that matters, kind of the core educational architecture and opportunity kind of stuff. Um, so that's what we're going to focus on. So um, this will be the basic flow. Uh, these are the topics. We'll give you a very brief Act 46 overview talk about why merge, then go over the proposed structure in detail, breaking it down from high school, middle school, uh, elementary school, and then the SEAL program, uh, also very exciting. Get into financials and then entertain your questions uh, after we're done. Sound good? Questions to this point. Great. Act 46, simple. The, the bottom line is to increase efficiency and equity by creating larger school districts, save money, opportunity goes up, outcomes improve. That's basically it. For this, uh, the incentive deadline is November 27th, so the work that we're doing right now needs to be done, signed with a bow on it by, uh, by November 27th, and we're confident that uh, we can get there uh, once we pass this uh, during, a, uh, during the vote. We'll talk about why merge. So there are a few different reasons um, why we, we would merge. I mean, first of all, there's, there's Act 46, but more importantly than that, we've seen declining enrollment um, in both of our schools over the past 20 years or so. Um, this graph shows that there was a peak enrollment um, in the mid-1990s. And since then, even though there have been years where things have spiked, um, the trend has continued downward. So it makes sense for us to bring our student populations together um, to be able to put some of the course offerings that our students are saying that they're interested in and that we believe they, they need um, in order to increase educational equity for all kids in our district. Um, while student populations have declined, um, costs have gone up. You're still heating a building and running a school with fewer kids in it. So if you do the, do the math, you're spreading that cost around for fewer students. So our per pupil costs have continued to increase while our populations have been decreasing. Um, and so that's, those are the, the main drivers, educational quality for our students and then um, cost containment for our communities. So what's the plan? This is basically the plan. This is the new architecture. It's quite simple. Um, it has four basic parts. So you have a Union High School, 9 through 12, which would exist at Royalton, where the Royalton School currently exists. The Union Middle School would be here in this building in Bethel. You can see the numbers, uh, you can see the numbers there. Bethel Elementary School, so our, our little ones would stay here. Likewise, the little ones would stay in Royalton where they are now. That's been a constant theme through all of our work is to keep, keep our, our younger students at home, close to home, uh, in, their, in their home community. So our elementary schools would also see an increase in what they're able to do. There would be an ability to coordinate curriculum between the two schools. Um, teachers would be able to collaborate on grade level teams or even on teams as we look at, at looping so that teachers would understand what they're preparing students for and they could work together. Um, parents would have a little bit more flexibility. Um, we've run some student scenarios to show what things might look like for families. And if a family lives on the, the Bethel side of the North Road, I'm jumping ahead, they might be able to send their student to school here in Bethel if they're traveling past Bethel Elementary um, to go to work in Randolph or if that's more convenient for them. Likewise, somebody who lives in Bethel and travels through Royalton might be able or might send their elementary student to Royalton if they worked in Royalton they might want that small child close to where they are. Um, it gives us an opportunity to expand our health curriculum. Right now, um, we have an elementary health curriculum here, and it's working pretty well. And so we could collaborate and build on best practices in both buildings um, to the benefit of all of our kids. 
There's an opportunity to expand the foreign language curriculum at the elementary school level. Um, and that's exciting for our students and families. Right now, there's a Eco Educating Children Outdoors program that's been happening in Bethel for two years. And I understand that over the summer, some Royalton educators got together with Bethel educators and they began looking at partnerships that exist even within our supervisory union without the merger. But if we were to merge, then that collaboration could continue and grow um, in some really exciting ways, I think, for our students. Um, and also, it's easier to find full-time staff when you can offer a, a full-time position. Right now, our schools are small enough that we have to offer part-time FTE or full-time equivalents um, to people often in order to make the budget work. And with two schools, we would be able to offer a full-time FTE for certain positions that there isn't necessarily room for full-time on one campus but on two campuses, um, you can offer that, offer that person a full-time job and serve our students in both schools equally. So this is the scenario that I was talking about. Um, our communications group heard from the community that they'd like to hear what, in practice, things could look like for students. Um, so we were thinking about um, a student who might live on the Royalton side of the North Road, so technically they're supposed to go to school in Royalton, but their family travels toward Randolph every day and sees the, a need to send their, their child to school in Bethel. It's a little closer if that little one gets sick and they need to come pick them up during the day um, and just makes life a little bit easier for them. And that opportunity would exist in this current program. Middle school? Pretty exciting capabilities and, and opportunities here uh, with the dedicated facility and faculty. Again, it would be it would be here, uh, kind of partitioned off uh, in this building. Uh, inter interdisciplinary teams, uh, very flexible schedules, student teacher advisory. So you'd have that contact between a student and an adult through through the uh, the, the, the the span of the child's experience. Um, expanded grade appropriate athletics. So we would have kids that are. Um, at the middle school age, uh, not like fleeting up and playing soccer with 9th, 10th, and, and 11th graders, which can be an issue, and we've had that, and that's just a function of having small schools. We want to give the kids as many opportunities as we can, but we don't have teams that we can build at every grade level. With this consolidation, more higher likelihood that we can do that and sort of right size and align uh, age to, to uh, participation. And then um, uh, the ability to incorporate this SEAL idea, the SEAL program, into the middle school level. Lisa talked about the ECO, Educating Children Outdoors program that we are already running, have been running for a couple of years. Royalton has it for the first year, uh, this year. So we have some good positive momentum there. And the SEAL program is something that we can, um, that we can build, um, build onto in the middle school and, and high school levels. Um, so one of the things that we've begun work on is creating interdisciplinary teams at the middle school level. So there would be grade level teams with teachers representing um, the core classes. So social studies, English, math, science, and they're planning and working together so that perhaps students are studying um, something driven by their interests, perhaps solar energy. Um, and so they are reading text in English class about solar energy in Vermont and some of the, the positive benefits of that, but also um, some of the things that people are concerned about, like pasture land being filled with solar panels. Um, and then in science class, they're looking at the benefits of sustainable energy and the, the potential downsides of solar energy. In math, they could be thinking about you know, angles and how you have to put those panels in order to make them work. Um, and in social studies, there are clear social implications of all the things that we've been talking about um, for our society and communities and global citizenship in terms of managing energy. So those grade level teams could actually all have a piece of that work and supporting students in understanding and solving problems and doing this project-based learning that is a part of our SEAL coordinator's work. We'll get more into that 
but that coordinator could help support teachers to make community connections and those grade level teams are preparing instruction that's designed for the developmental needs of middle school learners. Sometimes it's a little more hands-on than it is for high school kids, involves more movement than it sometimes does for high school kids. Those developmental needs are different and we have heard from parents that, that they would like for their middle school students in some ways to be separate from high school students to preserve um, sort of being young for as long as you possibly can. Um, so those interdisciplinary pieces are exciting for us. Uh, we've sent people to the Middle Grades Institute this past summer and they're doing collaborative work already. Um, our physical education, music, foreign language, and technology curriculum would be available and would support um, the interdisciplinary curriculum. It's been challenging here in Bethel to get um, a full foreign language program going at the middle school level. It's hard to say that, you know, when you have such a small population, they have to take foreign language or to figure out where to put that in the schedule. But with more students, it creates more opportunity. Also, um, more challenging math curriculum, when students are ready for a challenge, earlier, it makes it um, possible to offer those things if we have a larger student pool. Um, so the schedule would be flexible instead of being linked to a high school schedule, which most middle school schedules, when they're in the same building as a high school, end up, unfortunately, linked to the high school schedule. Um, it just makes sense that when the cafeteria is available for middle school lunch, that's when you have middle school lunch. Um, because you're trying to juggle other grade level meals um, and things like that. So the schedule can be more responsive to the needs of middle schoolers and those grade level teams can structure their days in flexible ways. Um, for example, if a grade level team is the only group of people being affected, if you don't have teachers teaching out of the grade level team, you could choose to show a film in the cafeteria in the afternoon and then have the full eighth grade team in here so that a teacher is not spending two days of class time showing that film. Instead, that can then trickle into all the classrooms. You've shown the film once, the whole eighth grade sees it. It doesn't take four days of instructional time. It takes whatever it takes to run the film. So those sorts of flexible schedule pieces will be available at our middle school level. Um, there could be whole school drama productions, community-based learning with our middle school students, um, small groups of students pursuing interests beyond what's in the curriculum, um, looking at, again, that project-based learning piece where student interest is allowed to drive the work that they're doing and teachers are facilitating their learning. So the middle school uh, student scenario here, as you can see, um, they access their daily programming from their, their grade level team and it's developed uh, specifically with the early adolescent brain in mind. And one interesting thing about this work that went into the design of the middle school uh, piece is that our team that worked the concept of operations, which was, which was from both, both current districts, worked with uh, the Tarrant Institute at, at UVM, which is essentially a, an educational think tank that focuses specifically uh, and specializes in this age range and grade range. And our folks um, have been working real hard uh, with them to put this together. And this is where the concept came from. But the flexible schedule that Lisa talked about, um, it allows, it allows uh, them to tailor their learning to their interests, very aligned with the whole philosophy of the, of the, uh, the PLP, the personalized learning plan is perfectly aligned with that. Um, and the student uh, might be able to uh, pursue science by looking, uh, pursuing interest in robotics. Uh, we might be able to um, have access for her to go and do those things. Um, and then advanced math and Spanish while still having time to do other uh, courses that, that are non-core courses like, like jazz band. So again, the focus here, interdisciplinary, kind of isolated, and flexibility. Um, so our class offerings in both sites um, would, so again, we're, if we're in the high school, we're in Royalton. That's the site that we intend to put the high school, grades nine through 12. Um, there would be more, more course offerings. Um, the exciting thing that I heard 
when we first looked at this and Dean and Owen shared some of the work that they've been doing is that even um, just with our two schools merging, the number of courses that they're able to put in the schedule and still make the schedule run would constitute an 80% increase in offerings for students at Wickham and a 30% increase for students in Royalton. So either way, it's an increase in student opportunity, excluding the fact, which is reality, that they would have more peers to work with. Um, there would be fewer under-enrolled classes. So right now, the, there's a large number of classes um, in both schools with fewer than 10 students. And some of the more challenging AP classes in Royalton, from what I understand, have under five. Um, and so those are the sorts of things that we'd like to see improve. There's potential to add engineering, medical science, computer science tracks. Um, one of the things that they're starting in 2018-19 at the Hartford Technical Career Center that we'll see um, show up on a future slide is a uh, um, computer security program at the Hartford Technical Career Center. Um, so if we were offering computer science at the high school, then that would dovetail really nicely with, with working with the Hartford Technical Career Center. Um, larger departments also provide more opportunity for teachers to collaborate. It's invaluable for professionals to be able to have time together and start to um, look at alignment, have conversations about what's happening in their classrooms, and to get ideas from each other. Um, it can be challenging to do that work day in and day out if you don't have peers to have those conversations with. So we're excited for people to be able to collaborate more. I'd like to call out uh, one thing, uh, and Lisa hit on it too, but what to take away from this little graph here. Uh, Lisa mentioned Royalton increased by 80%, Bethel increased by 30% in terms of course yeah. offerings. And you see that here. Um, think about that in terms of building capacity building capacity to teach. And you can do that in a couple of different ways. One, you can create new courses. You have the flexibility now to create new offerings. And that's where the potential to add engineering, medical science, computer science comes from. But you also have the, the ability, as, as we talked about here, to repeat other courses, mostly core courses. So right now, we have kids that can only take Algebra 2, say, because it's only offered at one block during, during uh, a certain, during the day, during the week. If you, have, if you give them some flexibility there, they can still take algebra, but take band, perhaps, or voice, which is something that they otherwise would not have been able to take because only one section of math was offered uh, before. So that's a, significant, that's a significant jump and a significant takeaway from the, for this program for, uh, uh, for the high school level. And some of what we've heard from community members is that students can't access classes because of the schedule, that the schedule gets in the way of students being able to access classes. One of the reasons why the schedule gets in the way is because as enrollment decreases, the need for a class to run more than once also decreases. So when you have that class one time on a schedule, it makes it much more challenging for students to have that match with their interests, their desires, and the other courses that they need to meet. So by having more students come together, bumping up the number of times that those courses can run, you put more flexibility back into the schedule. So again, Todd mentioned earlier um, athletics and having developmentally appropriate teams for our kids. Um, the state of Vermont, on average, is seeing a decrease in JV teams, um, not because kids don't want to play JV games, but because our small school systems struggle to field teams. Kids either play up on varsity or play down on middle school, and it doesn't leave a lot of room in the middle, even though many students are developmentally advanced beyond middle school and are still just a little too young or small for varsity. Um, so we anticipate having soccer, baseball, softball, basketball, um, all of the things that we typically have, things we've heard that students want and that we're interested in having and we think we have numbers to have, are winter track, lacrosse, golf, ultimate frisbee, hockey, um, volleyball, and potentially fencing. Um, so that would be really exciting for some of our students who've shared that those are things they're interested in. 
Yeah, it's just kind of an, another interesting, an interesting point on lacrosse specifically. It was a conversation that we had probably about a month ago, it seems like about a month ago. Uh, and the reason we're looking at bringing in um, lacrosse is because uh, right now, Chelsea girls uh, have a lacrosse team and they participate. So lacrosse, we're thinking, might be uh, an enticement to, to, make, um, to make this system um, something that they may want to look to to come and, and, and play for this team. So this, this particular one, lacrosse, I think is something we're looking at as maybe a quick turnaround for the next district to, uh, uh, to look at. So high school um, ex extracurriculars, um, again, I think these things came out of our student congress that feels like happened a long, long time ago. Um, but we heard from students that they were interested in expanded drama programs, musicals, um, and some potential additions. So jazz band, glee club, robot robotics, an outing club, a chess club, and junior ROTC. Um, I know that in Bethel we've had some of these things at various times but the ability to run them sort of has ebbed and flowed as students and teachers have time and interest. I'm sure the same, the same thing happens in Royalton as well. So the SEAL program, we've alluded to that a couple of different times, and it's uh, a pretty new and innovative concept, and it's a key part of our vision for this, uh, for this merger. Um, so to break it down for you as simply as we possibly can, um, essentially, uh, the learning in a classroom with a sage on the stage with a chalkboard or a whiteboard and just up there and talking and expecting people to memorize and, and parrot everything back that's not the only way to learn it's a valid way to learn classroom education is fantastic i learn very well that way but it's not the only way to learn so the seal program was developed to bring in um, and it's utterly focused on on tailored education to the kid to the to the student to bring in not only classroom education, as I just talked about, but other modes of education um, that, the, that the child might, might use. Could end a classroom, we talked about that. Community integration, actually getting resources from the community that either we can send a child to, to learn, or bring in to the school to teach courses. There's so much expertise out there uh, in our communities. We have engineers that are working engineers right now. We have, um, uh, we have math teachers, we have physics teachers, we have all sorts of people out there. We have farmers, we have all sorts that we can bring in um, to, to help the kids learn uh, that way. Trades as well. Work-based learning, sending kids out in a very formalized way um, to do an internship with a professional that's out in the community. In fact, uh, one of our graduates from, uh, from Bethel last year um, Taylor Washburn went and, d and did an internship with uh, a plumber. And Taylor is on a trajectory, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, but to get his license within the next year. Take some time to do this, but he's done his apprenticeship and he's now kind of on the journeyman phase and it will be a licensed plumber, which is a challenging thing to do um, probably within the next year or so. That all started here with this work-based learning um, uh, opportunity. Service learn dual enrollment. You know about dual enrollment. It's the ability for, for our kids to, um, to take high school courses, but also to take college courses at the same time. Um, that's all there. Uh, Project-based learning um, is when kids get together and work on a particular idea, a particular project. They collaborate, they create. And I'm, I, I, am, I have to tell you on this, um, I'm lucky enough to have been a, um, a, a, an advisor and mentor, student advisor, student mentor uh, for Randolph's project-based learning program for the last three years. And so I have been in their classrooms and I've talked to them. And what amazes me about it is not just the substantive stuff they do. For example, uh, one of the projects was um, documentary filmmaking. So actually going out and making a film and putting that film on YouTube, etc. Radio Free Randolph, which was setting up and operating a radio station doing interviews, playing music, setting up, all of that. So it's substantive stuff that they learn. But I also noticed um, that they learn meta skills. They learn about leadership. They learn about project management. They learn about planning. Um, because it's a semester long. It's a big deal. And um, every year that I go back and talk to a class, um, I just see growth from the first time I talk to them to the end of it. And it's just it's bewildering. Not bewildering, but it's, it's enlightening and it's heartening to see that happen. Um, RGCC, so that doesn't go away, that still exists. And then as we talked about before, we already, already have a core um, education, ed educating children outdoors 
uh, program, and this is something that is very tied to Vermont as green space. We have a lot, you know, we have a lot of forest out in the back. Royalton has a lot of great facilities um, and, and great territory that the kids can explore, can roam. Uh, and the intent here is to build upon what we already have um, and incorporate kind of more focused environmental science, environmental project learning um, into, into that system. So the environmental piece is, is key to this. This is how it would be manned or how it would be, how it would be resourced. Uh, two SEAL coordinators who would actually coordinate the working with the community and it takes a lot of work to do that kind of coordination and set kids up to do in internships during work-based learning, to set up uh, project-based learning projects and to monitor that and to set, guide set guidelines and goals. Uh, they would do that, but they would also be teaching, uh, teaching as well uh, a certain number of courses. <coughs> um, Again, outdoor resources, both Bethel and South Royalton. And um, we have explored and, and have seen a willingness on the part of Johnson State College and Castleton to work with us on uh, the outdoor education uh, piece of this as well. So part of this would be something like um, a student might go in to a program and come out of it with wilderness first responder, with, um, uh, with leave no trace ethics you know, certification, things like this, all very, very available and these, these uh, Institutions, Castleton Johnson, are excited about the program. They want to work with us. No details, really, specifically about what that is, but they want to be there. They want to be there with us to work with us, so uh, we want to do that. So we have two high school scenarios, um, just so that people can understand what this might look like for students. So if we had a student who really felt too confined in the classroom and was ready for an opportunity beyond what's offered in your traditional curriculum, that student could work with our SEAL coordinator, um, take part in community-based learning, find a local farm that they want to work with, spend a couple days a week on a farm, and then spend the other days in the classroom. So they're taking part in hands-on, community-based experience, they're doing an internship, but then we have a SEAL coordinator who can help that person to document the proficiencies that they need to meet in order to graduate on time with their class because um, Act 77 tells us that students need to show proficiency in a variety of areas. And I think that teachers in the state of Vermont have been trying to wrap their heads around that and to expect a 17-year-old without guidance to be able to figure out, I need to meet this proficiency and here's how I'm gonna do it, um, wouldn't be fair to our students. So the SEAL coordinator um, would be there to help them um, go out, do the things that they are passionate about and excited about. At the same time, um, they're meeting proficiency and they're on track to graduate with a diploma just like everybody else. Um, our other student, st student scenario might be a student who um, has taken a lot of electives, has taken a lot of the core classes that have been offered. It gets to be their senior year. They don't really have a ton left to do, but they're excited about other challenges within their school. And their leadership is important to a school community. At least I think that's important to a school community. It makes me really sad when I hear that more than half of the senior class went to BAST. And those kids aren't in the building for our younger students to look up to anymore and to work with them. Um, so this student makes a decision to spend half a day in Spanish, I mean half a day in Royalton. They take Spanish 4 because they've taken it for other years and they want that on their transcript. They also are able to continue to be in band in high school um, in a leadership role because they've been in that band for quite some time. Um, they're in their community high school and then they're able to access program at the Hartford Area Career and Technology Center um, in the computer science program focused on internet security that they're excited about and is perhaps on the path that they hope to pursue after they leave high school. So now we're going to move into um, talking a little bit about the financials, the numbers. Before we move into that, though, I, I do want to, um, Lisa and I both, w and in fact for our whole committee, I think I can speak for, is to thank the administrators uh, and our educators so much for doing a lot of this work. In a lot of ways, we're up here just, you know, we're talking dogs. They did the crunch work. They did the crunch work of putting these concepts of operations together. They're the professionals, and thank you very much for all of the help going into this because I think we've created a really good. Point. Okay, now on to the good news. 
Um, financial incentives, you've probably seen this before, right? Um, part of the incentive for Act 46 is a decreased tax, tax rate starting for the 18-19 school year. It's, it starts at 0 0.08 and then it goes down over four years by, by two cents. The other piece of it that applies to us here is uh, the transition, transition uh, facilitation grant, which is to the tune of 150,000 one time first year of operation. So that's on there. Um, what didn't come over was the small schools grant. Um, that's because Rochester's not part of this plan anymore. And what was the other one? The um, hold harmless, hold harmless, which is which is protection against um, loss of too many kids affecting our cost of cost per pupil. There's a whole, there's a lot of math behind it. You can go over it if you want. Don't think we need to. Um, right. So here is what things will look like for Bethel with the two scenarios. So no action. Um, which it says underneath that's not actually possible. So no action, um, we could vote to take no action, but at the end of November, the state board is going to start looking at um, how they want to move schools um, together. So the, that's the tax rate projected um, if we didn't take act action. And then um, the lower line is proposed with 36 extra tuition students in our high school, so our nine through 12 grades. Um, that number seems like it is within the realm of possibility. Right now in Royalton, there's 25 tuition students. Um, so that would add only 11, and we're assuming that Chelsea is moving to choice. Um, there are other schools in the area that are looking seriously at becoming choice schools. And so they um, hopefully would look favorably at our combined school. <coughs> so we do think that 36 tuition students is a number that is reachable for us. Um, so there's significant savings. There was more savings, um, but we realized that the state of Vermont said you can't have a more than 5% decrease. And so that was where the floor was for the savings um, for us. So that's why you see that the rate um, is 1.73 in F fiscal year 18, um, but then it drops the following year um, and it doesn't continue to go up again until fiscal year um, 2022. And at that point, um, I have yet to see a year when my school tax bill actually goes down. I will be shocked if this becomes reality because there's always that incremental I increase i feel like um so having those savings for a number of years and then seeing them start to climb again um, for dramatically increased opportunity uh, i think is exciting yeah and, and i think that rate to uh, we're all kind of hopeful about it, that rate to though going up is um can be somewhat controlled by the number of kids that we have in our school. And if we build a good system, which we are building a good system, right. that number of 36, which works for us now, we think that's a good assumption now for this year, the next year, um, is that probably gonna go up. And if that goes up, you're increasing, you're increasing your ADM, the number of kids in the school, and your tax rate. It's, it may not go down, but it may not go, rise up uh, as sharply after, after 22. You know, one of the things that I think, uh, it doesn't relate directly to the numbers, but is, it does, um, that I think is really exciting, is that if and when our towns pass this plan, then we get to hand over the things that the committee's been doing to the experts. So the administrators, the teachers, can then start to work with it and take ownership of it and put more details around what they'll actually be doing with students. And that's really exciting for me to, to, to see what they'll do um, because I have a lot of, a lot of faith in them. Um, so there's Bethel and Royalton, um, a comparison of what each community stands to save or what the rates will look like for each community. And again, Bethel savings are, are there, but not quite as deep in fiscal year 19 um, as Royalton's because we can't go down more than 5% um, as dictated by the state of Vermont. So that is as much as we could decrease in that year and then the following year and then by fiscal year 21 our rate would be the same. So governance for, for this uh, 
what's happening is you have two districts that are coming together to become one union district. That union district needs to be governed. That will happen um, with a union district school board. That will be a six member board, three directors, uh, members, directors of the board from, from each town. And those will be voted on by, by, by members of both towns. So you will have, see on your ballot six names, um, three from Bethel, three from Royalton, and you in Royalton will vote for all six, and we in Bethel will vote for all six. So part of that is going to be, um, and we talk, talked about this a lot at, at our meetings, is to kind of get the word out um, about the candidates and who they are and what they stand for to give you a little bit more uh, information than we had last, last time we voted. It was a challenge, and we need to, to, to get those out. Uh, the budget, uh, it's voted on Australian okay. ballot, and... Um, I, I think yep. that was a change that we made, and that's actually a oh. mistake in the slide. Did we? Oh. I think in the report, it's that they'd be voted on in both towns from the floor. Right. Um, so that's a mistake. One, in, one, one yeah. town meeting. One town meeting, but it's a vote from the floor. Right. So we'd still right. we have yeah. Yeah, informational yeah, yeah. meetings. Yep. Yep. Um, and because that was a concern that community members voiced, was that they really value coming together, discussing the budget, and voting from the floor on the budget. So that was something that we did put in the official plan. The plan is up on our Facebook, the Bethel Royalton merger um, Facebook page, that the plan that went to the state of Vermont, um, the state board is there. So if you wanted to take a look and make sure um, that check that fact, um, you absolutely could. Yes. Isn't it also true that the three members uh, from each community have to be nominated by their respective communities? Yes. Right. Yeah. John Olmsted wouldn't come to Bethel to get his signature. Correct. Right. Yeah. The nomination paperwork and the requirements for the signatures happens within each of the candidates' uh, nominees on communities. And they're due on Monday. And they're due on the 25th. And there could potentially yeah. be more than three from each town, but you would vote for three from each town. Right. right. So there's right. a one year position, two year position, right. and three year position from each town. Yep. And we're planning to hold meetings in early October. Yeah and invite everybody who's declared their candidacy um, to speak at those two meetings so that we'll know who those people are. That was some feedback we got after the last round that people were confused about who was on the ballot um, and in many cases had no idea who people were from the other community that they were voting for. So those people will all be invited um, to those meetings early in October and we'll have an opportunity to meet them at that time. Yes. Um, I think there was a meeting in South Royalton last evening. You may have used the same presentation. That last slide that was up was corrective commentary given to the audience last evening <coughs> on that last bullet. I think that about um, the floor. Or last night or the 17th. I didn't pay attention to when you guys There, there was one last night. Yeah, yeah there the, was the one last night. Last night, the yeah. bullet said uh, from the floor. Didn't right. Say okay, huh. right. So I just wanted to make sure that. Yeah, we've been yeah. bouncing these back and forth, yeah. and well, and I think even if it didn't say on it, I think John yeah. clarified it pretty well that it was yeah, going to yeah. be a district meeting. Yeah. <clears throat> yes, sir. Does that mean both schools go to one meeting? Yes. So the meeting, if the meeting is in South Royalton, Bethel people have to go to South Royalton to <laughs> to right. hear the thing, but then they come back to Bethel to vote. No, we all vote together. Right, so that's my understanding. No, um, so what we discussed was that we would move back and forth. So one year it would be in Bethel, and one year it would be in Royalton, the following year back in Bethel. So the school meeting would be well warned, and it would go back and forth between the two communities to make sure um, that we kept things as fair as possible. So those are the next steps. Uh, once the new board is installed, they will craft with the administrators and finalize the budget, just get into that budget cycle. They have a lot of work to do be, just because of kind of where it falls in the year, uh, late October into November. Um, new curriculum, so there's gonna be a lot of curriculum building that's gonna happen in, in all, of the, all of the schools, and then we'd be operational for July of 2018, and this would, this would start in uh, the 18-19 school year. And that concludes these remarks. Any questions or Comments. Yes, Mr. Putney. A couple of times you mentioned Hartford Vocational and just kind of gave a quick RC team as usual. It sounds like you're moving the technical thing to Hartford. Is there a reason why you didn't say 
Hartford and Randolph, or are you just? Okay, so RTCC, I know was up there a couple of times. RTCC is what's more familiar for Bethel, so Hartford is the new option. Both remain on the table, and I think that the articles that we've agreed to with RTCC indicate that if there's a program at Randolph that's also at Hartford, our students have to go to Randolph. Um, but if there's a program like cosmetology, for example, or computer security um, down in Hartford that is not offered in Randolph, then students can have that option as well. There are six programs in Hartford currently that the kids could participate in. Not all there, they've got like 18 of them down there, but only six of them can they participate in because they're offered, the others are all, right. also offered. And, and, and that's not by the Articles Agreement, that's by state law. That's by state law. Oh, okay. State law dictates right. that. Okay, so like culinary, they have in both places, so a student who wants to pursue culinary goes to Randolph. Yeah. Yes? Isn't uh, one of the features though with the tech education is that whereas Randolph's a full day program, Hartford, so that scenario where the student wants to stay in his in his core class for mm -hmm. half a day and then go to say Hartford for the other stuff, that option now becomes available to all of us. Right, that option becomes available to high school students in Bethel and high school students in Royalton. Well, it's already there for high school students in Royalton. Yes? I was just curious if the health sciences, if that was one of the programs available at Harvard. Yeah, I don't know. I know there's health careers in Randolph. I don't know if they're considered too similar. They differ? No, right. I think they're, they're, they're basically the same program. Uh, they have different titles, but they work under the same SIP code and the same curriculum. Um, so if you go to the, in the new high school, you'd have to go to Randolph to take them. Other questions? Um, yes, Mr. Chad. Uh, uh, should there Oh, I was, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Did yep. something, you want to say something? Right. Yeah, uh, we, you can go now. All right. Okay. <laughs> um, during the, past year, I've been to several of the meetings, and uh, Mr. Sears uh, was constantly uh, NGO, jumping on the thing that critical mass, uh, 950 students, mm -hmm. critical mass. And every time an alternative plan uh, or a different concept came up, it was always critical mass. Uh, do you, do you feel like this, I'd like to personally ask you if you feel like this program is really big enough? Is it really what your vision of, of size should be? I mean. Yeah, uh, thank you for the question. Uh, honestly, I think that we are still um, two nano schools creating a small school. That's what I think. So my answer is no, I don't. I would like, to, I wish it could have involved more schools and I wish that we could get a higher student count here. But I am absolutely confident when I say that given the work that we've done, this system, this merger does a lot of good for our kids and it is better than what we have now. Uh, in, in the uh, document, uh, They've kept the clause in there that they would shoot for a bigger, larger school. Uh, do you foresee that being, uh, if you could load the board with that kind of personality, that you could have a larger school? I'm, I'm unsure what you're referring to. We haven't put anything about a bigger, larger school in. Well, we were starting to build a building. We don't have, what's that? You may be referring to the clause that was left in about buildings. Um, my understanding, what I looked at when I presented to the State Board of Education said there would no, be no, no new no building. building. Specifically, there's a line in the middle of the current plan that said that we are not looking at a new building. And to clarify, when you say that, I'm, I'm talking about student numbers, not facilities. When I say bigger school, I'm talking about student numbers. In fact, we, we talked about building. There is no, no new construction as part of this at all. That right. we discussed. No. I mean, uh, being attractive to students and communities that offer choice, I think that benefits us all, both um, our students in terms of having more, more peers to work with and our communities in terms of tuition being positive um, financially. Right. So. Uh, uh, thinking back to what you said 
with two nano schools, if the original proposal went through, we'd have three nano schools still with one small school. Small school. Yes. Um, Mr. Putney has a question, and then I can come back. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, as everybody probably knows, I think Bethel should have choice, although I think your proposal is 100% better than what we have presently. Um, what my question is, has anybody given any thought to should this get voted down in either Bethel or, or um, Royalton to other options? Um, is there any discussion going with maybe Rochester and Stockbridge about Maybe that would be an opportunity instead of just sitting here and waiting for um, the state to come down and say, okay, this is a good program, we're going to do this when it's been voted down a number of times. And although Bethel, if Bethel votes for it, again, has voted for it every time, and, and for whatever reason it's got voted down, we really haven't had an opportunity to vote on some other, other thing. And I think that the Bethel School Board would be um, remiss without looking into other options that might be available should this get voted down. And I think um, maybe because I've been vocal about, about um, my Bethel being choice that a lot of people think I'm totally against this merger. I'm not, but uh, a lot of people think I, the people that are against it have talked to me and I think there's, this isn't a slam dunk. I think there's a lot of people that have a whole lot of questions. I think more in Royalton than in Bethel. I think Royalton people don't want to have their path of their decisions on their, their school be decided by Bethel people when they have more, more people. They're not crazy about their younger kids being the ones that have to, have to um, be transported. So again, I just think that the Bethel School should be looking at other options and have them there so that when the state comes down and says, what do you think? Well, this is what might happen if we joined Rochester and Stockbridge. And as far as the tuition things, if your program works with 36 extra kids, hopefully the Bethel kids with choice will fill the numbers. I so we had plan B on the table, which seemed like a pretty clear choice to designation or choice. Um, when that was on the table with Rochester looking at that path, um, I don't know what the experience was like for Todd or other people in the room, um, but I kept hearing from people at Belmaine's and at Shaw's and in a variety of places um, well, it's really a shame. It's too bad we couldn't just work with Royalton and keep our schools in our communities. Um, that was part of the reason that we went to the state board and asked that that plan be revoked is because I was hearing so overwhelmingly, and I think other members of the board and the community um, were as well. There were some people, yourself included, who emerged who said, you know, choice would be great for us to look at. But I feel like we had a path to choice on the, on the table and we were hearing from people who said, this isn't really what we want. We want a school in our community. I don't think it's a slam dunk, but I also think that time um, is sort of of the essence here. Um, I believe Chelsea and Tumbridge are going to the state board tomorrow, and I think tomorrow's meeting is probably the last meeting that boards can actually bring a plan to the state board, get it approved, have a vote and then the 30-day certification period after the vote occur um, and still meet that November 27th deadline without the state looking at imposing reconfigurations. Um, so I feel like we, we sort of danced up to that line and then stepped back from it. And we're not exploring those other options at this point in time because there's it, it feels sort of unethical or disingenuous to be working on two things that are quite different at the same time. I'm not suggesting it, but I'm okay. suge well, I am suggesting that you, you talk about it and maybe throw the numbers out there and, and we have that we sort have. of and, thing. And we did say at our board meeting, I think it was about a month ago, that if this fell apart, if Bethel said, no, this isn't what we're interested in, 
Um, and if the opportunity presented itself, then we would feel bound to explore toys. Knowing, um, knowing that we would not be doing it um, and be able to meet the Act 46 uh, lines. So, actually, I'm more concerned about Royalton voting it down than Bethel. But um, should it get voted down, it gets voted down regardless of who does it. Um, I'm sorry, I lost my train of thought. Um, you were just about to say what's going to happen after it gets voted out. <laughs> <laughs> then, then we all have a party. Oh, my yes. point is, it's really hard to judge what the communities are doing. Uh -huh. Look at this room, and this is the biggest number of people I've seen at any of these meetings. And I didn't go to the early ones. and. and but shame on me, but I think it's really hard to know what the community is thinking, and I think there's a lot of misconceptions out there, and for the life of me, I don't understand why parents aren't here asking the questions that, that I am or anybody else is. But I completely agree. So, uh, so I think understanding what these people are, and we got a lot of older people who vote more than the young people who are, don't have kids in school, like myself, and, and I'll shut up. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate having you here. Mr. Krause? This is a, I don't know if it's, well, yeah, it's pertinent to the, to the combining of the schools. Per, students with physical disabilities, their ability to participate fully in SEAL and in the outdoor education are what, if any, uh, what, adjustments or, or whatever do we provide for that? Um, so I think that that's a question better suited to one of our administrators, so I'll let I appreciate that because <clears throat> uh, we, you know, if you assume, and, and we do, that educators want to educate everybody. Mm -hmm. So that's like what we believe, but we also have to. By law. We are accommodating some students already. Good. And what we we don't want anybody to see that or know that as much as possible, but we do it. But if we ever ran into a situation where there was some sort of barrier, we would reach out to experts at the next level, the state probably or further. So it's a great question. Thank, Thank you. you. Any other questions? Yes. Yeah, it's a political statement, I guess, really, but I personally believe that apathy is the biggest enemy of public education. And when you divide a town up uh, and take away its school, or take away its governance, uh, you, you're going to increase apathy. And I was wondering if there has ever been a study, uh, there's been all kinds of studies, but has there ever been a study on whether consolidation increases apathy? I, I haven't seen a study that speaks to whether consolidation increases apathy. But I think in our last round of talks, you brought that up. Um, and so I had an opportunity, because I do some work with the Roland Foundation, um, and that's a network um, with Vermont schools. And so as a Roland Fellow, I was able to network with other schools that they connect with. And so I pointedly spoke to administrators and to community members who came to meetings that I was at and educators from those communities. And they shared that after a short time, um, it felt like one community. Specifically, I um, took to heart the things that I learned about the Rivendell School District because they were even larger when we were working with Rochester. Their kids commute even further than our kids would have commuted with the Rochester kids there. And what they noticed is that parents still work really hard to get to their kids' games. Um, they do a thing where they do a community movie night. So some of the movies that have been produced in Vermont about the opiate epidemic and some of the movies that have been produced in Vermont about a variety of other social issues. They would show screenings at school, much as we've done here in Bethel, and I'm sure you've done in Royalton as well. Um, and they still saw people from every segment of the population, and they were looking um, at, that, at, at that data. Who's coming? 
which kids aren't getting parents to school? Are they from specific communities or is there something else at work? Um, and what they found is that their community became bigger um, and that after a little while, you saw parents from one town sitting with parents from another town. It didn't happen overnight, but people are united in their love for their kids and, and it gets people out is what, what I had heard. So I don't have empirical evidence or a study I can put my finger on, but anecdotally, that's what I know. John? I was just thinking about Peter's comment about the apathy, and I can't speak to how it works in Bethel because I haven't been to your school meetings, but, uh, you know, as uh, spending time on the Royal School Board and then going to, to this process, uh, I came in late with you folks. Uh, apathy isn't confined to just a consolidated district. I see it in our own community at home. I mean, we have 1,900 registered voters. I mean, if you weed the list out, there's maybe 1,400 legitimate. But 600 showed up for an election. Every nine years of uh, going to school board meetings to vote on our budgets, if I saw more than 250 people in the audience, I was shocked. I don't think that happened all that often. Uh, so to say that consolidation leads to apathy is very misleading. That apathy takes place in communities regardless point. It's only hope that this may enlarge our community and have the same effect that uh, you just talked about in Rivendell. I think the way that you defeat apathy is with energy and what we're trying to do with this is build energy with the two communities. So I reject the premise that, that consolidation equals apathy. I just don't buy it. Rebecca? Yeah, I for you at that wholeheartedly, I think there's so many creative ways that we can counter the apathy. I also agree with the comment that it's a shame there aren't more parents here and more community members here in this process. And I think it may be partly a factor of apathy, but also a real convenience issue. I don't know that the word has gotten out to a lot of people. It's really hard for parents to be here at this time of night on a weeknight. Um, there's not a lot of information necessarily circulating on social media, or at least not in formats that catch people's eye when they're scanning for the latest headline. So I'm wondering what the boards are doing in particular in advance of the vote to get the story out and really tell people more broadly in the community about the benefits. And um, I would hope that we could follow up with more of that in the future, too. Well, this came up last night, <laughs> and John, John answered it very elegantly. Um, we do have a, a multi-pronged communication plan, and I can tell you, Rebecca, the only thing that I think that we are not planning on doing is going door to door and knocking on doors and giving out pamphlets. But we have um, sent homes at school. We have, we're going to blast you know, articles in the Herald and the Valley News. We have a Facebook presence. I think we might tweet. Don't know if we're going to Instagram. We're going to have emails. We're going to have a lot of that stuff. And any help and suggestions that you would have, especially given your expertise to help craft that plan and make it better, we would welcome it. But yes, it's on our mind. Um, and uh, yeah. Yeah, if you can help, we, we would gladly accept it. Lisa? Um, so send home, that means that little notes are going to go into the backpacks of all the kids? Good, because I, that, I think that could be really effective. But uh, when we talk about apathy, you know, one thing that I think, if, if we ended up having to go to choice, if that, I think that that would create apathy. And, and that's one of, the, one of the reasons why I don't, that I hope we don't go that direction, that I hope that this passes in both towns. Because I really think that this could invigorate both towns and really build a strong relationship or strong relationships between towns so that we don't have that imaginary line. In fact, you know, on the, on the issue of community building, that's one of the reasons, one of the key arguments we decided to go with the governance model that we went to where um, folks, voters from both communities need to learn and engage with the other, commu the other community, you know, uh, people, nominees on there to learn about them and learn about that community. That was very, very intentional to help to forge those, uh, start forging those bonds, which we expect to grow um, in the future. Rachel? I just wanted to comment on the social media, Facebook specifically, with their algorithms and all that stuff. The more you all like and share, the more it's going to show up. Because um, that's just the way Facebook works. The more people like and share, the more people see it. Because um, I can post on that Facebook page all I want, but it's still seven people saw, seven people saw, seven people saw. So you got to like, you got to share, or seven people are going to see it. <laughs> right, and even if you don't, 
necessarily agree. Um, having people come out and express their opinions regardless, that civil discourse is so important. Um, so sharing and getting people to come out, getting people to engage um, really is important. Owen? Uh, <clears throat> just a reminder, we've only just begun. We're going to do this again. Right. On October 4th, right here, and October 5th in South Royalton. Mm -hmm. and, and Thank you. The and then again the 23rd. The 23rd the in both. But also, I would assume, and I know, that any committee member would speak to anyone or any group. Yep. Shoot us emails, ask questions. Um, Shannon and then Dave. Okay. I was just going to say, I'm actually really up to sort of bounce off a couple of points here. Really excited about the opportunity for community building here. If you think about how our numbers have dwindled and our programs and our sports teams, and not that school is all about sports, <coughs> but it was when I was there. Kind of. um, but that's where parents get really engaged, is, is at the end of the day at whatever soccer game or whatever's going on. And we don't have a lot of opportunity for that if we don't have enough kids on those teams. And I grew up, I grew up in Sharon, so I grew up in a choice town. If you want to see apathy about your, your teenagers in town and what they're doing, nobody knows anything. We all sort of went to four different schools. There's no community spirit there. And this way we get to keep all of the kids from Bethel, all the kids from Royalton all together and just build a bigger community where we're all involved in their lives and stay involved K through 12 instead of just K through six. So it's one of the things I worry about with choice is that you just don't have a lot of community after sixth grade. Dave? Are you doing something Saturday? We have the forward festival, yep. You, have you, you mean is our group doing yeah, something Saturday? Something, little corner in the middle yeah, of town? Yeah, we're not playing, but we'll be there. Right. I know I'll be there. You have it. I can wear a button that says "Ask me about school consolidation." I'll put a little table on my table. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. Thank you. I was shocked to learn something about our school uh, that we were the last school that allowed their parents to walk their little kid down to the first grade, and now. Uh, that's been discontinued. Uh, so we're like the rest of the people. Um, but to me, it's sort of an indication that, um, you know, the school has an identity bigger than the, the community, bigger than the people. Uh, and I really think parents, grandparents, uncles, aunts, in the community make the community. If, if they're denied access to their school, it becomes, you're, you're more prone to the, the shootings and the things like that. If people are part of the thing, they, there's a more of a chance that you're not going to avoid, you're going to avoid some of that. Uh, it, it's that. It's that business of the school being so professional that it's out of reach of, of the people that don't come to meetings like this. They're all professionals. Uh, well, I, I understand what you're saying, and I, I enjoy that community feel in schools. Um, but I, I also know that as we look at public safety, unfortunately, there are a lot of things that have shifted in our society. And having you know, been in a school where you're locked down because there's a parent who's angry or upset about, you know, a divorce or custody battle. I think that that's why schools have been pushed to make those sorts of hard decisions. And it does feel like an intrusion and it feels like it separates community. But to be a school looking at liability issues, if you're not creating those boundaries, um, could be a real challenge for our schools and our communities. I think we get guidelines from the state of Vermont and the federal government and our schools have to comply. So, um, I think we have school board meetings. I don't want to cut anybody off. Please feel free to send me an email. Um, 
but we do have both board meetings here in the building, separate rooms, 7 p.m. We're already going to start a little late. What's that? At the end of the Wickham Hall. At the end of the Wickham Hall. All right. Thank you all for coming out. Bring your neighbors on October 4th. Thank you.